male created he them. Okay, now you'll notice also that there is a, and, and I realize that man would be in reference to mankind, but mankind, but in this particular verse in Hebrew, you're actually looking, when it says God created man, you're actually looking at the word, it's a singular word. And it says created him. In the image of God created he him. And then it says male and female created he them. That's not in a sequence that's actually saying this is what he did. He created him. He created them. And so there's a, there, there's a singularity as well as a plurality when we see this verse as well. So we see let us make man. It's talking about God. We see the plurality of God. And then we see the singularity of God. He made man. All right. Then it says, then he, then he goes into God created man. All right. In his image, in the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Okay, so uh, last time we basically were looking at what the church's purpose was and, uh, and, and how that we are to give praise and glory to God, to Jesus Christ. And uh, we, need to, we need to know what that looks like. I want to show you a few more things tonight that might start off unusual, like I, like I started off the last time. Uh, but it will all begin to make sense toward the end here, okay? So here's my question. Who's willing to read some verses here? Can I, can I see your hands here? Okay. All right, I see a few here. Uh, all right, so, so y'all y'all are okay? Okay, all right. And then uh, Brother Glenn, Marianne, anybody else? Okay, all right. Well, Harrison, you want to? Okay, all right, so Harrison, if you could read Acts 2.44, Marianne. Um, uh, now, just be on the lookout. I'm gonna, they're, they're a little bit out of order here, okay? So I'm, 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 uh, just, you just hold on to your verse. When I call on your verse, then you, I, I meant to put it, put it in the right order, but it's not, in, it's not in the right order up here. So Acts 2.44, Harrison, Marianne, Acts 4.32, um, Jonathan, uh, Acts 17.28, Alicia, uh, 1 Corinthians 10.17, uh, bro, Brother Glenn, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 1 to 3. All right, and then I'm going to go back around here, okay? So, uh, so Harrison, so you have Acts 2.44, right? Okay, I also would like for you to read uh, Galatians 3.28 as well, okay? And then, um, Marianne, if you could have Ephesians 4.4 4 ready. Um, you're, with your ability, you can just print them all out, probably, if you wanted to. You know, I mean, not print them, oh, copy them, and, you know, anyway. Um, so you have Ephesians 4.4, 4, okay. And then, um, Jonathan, if you could read Colossians 3.11. Okay, so um, I want to help us focus our thoughts on the position the church occupies in relation to the work of Christ. All right, so it's not so much about the, it's not so much about the work of Christ that I'm concerned about as much as the, the church and uh, the position that it occupies in relation to the work of Jesus Christ. This, this, this message starts off a little bit complicated, but just I, I, I want to explain everything to you before I actually get to the simple parts of it, okay? Uh, but it's very important that we understand the value of the church because often the work of Christ is so emphasized that we almost get this impression, well, God doesn't really need us anyway. We hear that on the pulpit a lot. We hear, God doesn't really need us. You know, we just need to be available, you know, and all this stuff. I'm going to be honest with you. That kind of stuff didn't make any sense to me. I thought, why in the world are we even offering our services, willing to surrender ourselves to God? Why is he so desperate to have us? And, you know, well, it's because he loves us, all this kind of stuff. But still, there's a, there, there was still a hole for me when it came to... Does God need us or not? And uh, you know that that was you know that that was my question, based on His design from the very beginning, from creation. Okay, He desperately needs us, based on His design. All right, He chose to let that happen. He designed everything to where He desperately needs us, and I hope by the end I'll be able to help you see that. Okay, first of all. It's quite clear that the first woman, Eve, described in Genesis 2, 18 to 24, and the church, described in Ephesians 5, 22 to 32, are definitely related, okay? Now, if you're not familiar with that, I want you to look at uh, uh, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18 here. It says this, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. 
I will make him and help meet for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam and whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found and help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib, which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of the man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Okay, now then it goes on to say in, uh, in Ephesians, it says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself forth, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives, even as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. And then it says, uh, it says, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. And then it says, it, 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 says it, it, it basically goes on, it quotes in Genesis where man is to cleave unto his wife and they too shall be one flesh. So it ends in that very same verse in Ephesians. So we have, uh, we, we have this, it's, very, it's a very obvious parallel between the first woman, Eve, and the church. When God created Eve, it was then said, be fruitful, be fruitful, okay? We, we often wonder why souls aren't being saved, and it's partially because it's the church's responsibility that souls get saved, okay? Um, you know, we, we say, why isn't God saving souls? Well, God wants to save souls, it's just there needs to be a partnership there, uh, but devising ways to do that, coming up with new ideas, all right, coming up with new plans, you know, how are we going to get people to want to open their door during this COVID-19 pandemic? You know, maybe we should just go to the stores. Devising all of these kinds of ideas, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's not the answer. And I think God placed the church in the time that she is in today to make that brutally clear. I think he wants, I think he's trying to say, church, you can't do this without me. So what's the answer? All right, well, look with me again at, uh, at Genesis 2.18 here. And I want you to just notice what it says, okay? Let's look at it again. And Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. All right, so what is the answer as far as, 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 far as the church and, and bearing fruit? Well, let's, let's keep going here. All right, um, and, and out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field. All right, so he... He gave names to all the cattle, all these things, and, uh, and, and there was not an help meet found for Adam. Look at verse 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh thereof. And the rib, which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of the man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Just as nothing of God's creation formed from the dust of the earth would suffice for Adam, so likewise, nothing that is outside of Christ is not the church. Okay, so what, what, I'm, what, what am I getting at here? What I'm saying is this. Anything that denies that Jesus Christ is, not, it, it, that is God is not of the church. All right, that's, that's one of those... That's one of those proof texts that help us to see that there's nothing outside of the church. Anything, anyone who claims to be a who claims to be a church is not the church without Jesus Christ. Without with without them recognizing who Jesus Christ is. All right. So this this is why any religion that denies Christ's deity is automatically of this world and is a cult and is not the church. Uh, look at Genesis one twenty six. Okay. Um, Look what, it, look what it says. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over. All right, that's singular. All right. Let us make man. And then it says, let them. 
All right, now when you look at that word man, let us make man, when you see that word man, you're actually seeing a singular Hebrew word. You look it up in the Hebrew and actually you'll find that it's singular. It's one, well, it's one being, okay? But then he says them, all right? So you see the parallel between God, let us, God created him, all right? And then, uh, and then it goes on and it says, let us make man singular in our image, all right? Uh, uh, and let them, all right, there's plural, okay. Um, now, again, uh, in 27, it says, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. I'm getting somewhere with this, all right? Now, uh, who, whoever had 1 Corinthians 10, 17, if you could read that for me. Uh, for we being many are one bread and one body, we are all partakers of that one bread. Okay, did you did you hear that? Okay, so what all right, we are all partakers of one bread, and so therefore we are made of the same body, all right, which is Jesus Christ. This is why we take communion, all right? It, it's it's not an individual I or an individual you, it's not a Mr. Smith. It's not a Mrs. Jones that makes up the church. Individuality is excluded when it comes to the church. The church is all one in Christ, okay? This is why we see what we see in the next verses that I want my readers to read. Uh, so uh, if I could have, uh, I think Harrison, I think I gave you Galatians 3.28 if you oh, could. Um, 3.28? Yeah, Galatians 3.28. Here we go. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male or nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Okay, do you see how that do you see how it how that there's a singularity involved here, okay? We're all one in Christ Jesus. Alright? We are the rib that was taken from Adam. Alright, I'm getting somewhere. Now Ephesians 4.4, 4, who had that one? There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called, and one hope of your calling. Okay, so there's one body and one spirit, referring to the church and Jesus Christ. Okay, uh, Colossians 3.11, who had that one? Wherefore, there is neither free nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Okay, so just as Eve was taken from Adam, uh, so what makes us the church comes from Jesus Christ. All right, we are, we, we're nothing but, we are, uh, um, uh, uh, we're, we're nothing. Uh, let, me, let, me just, let me just put it to you this way, okay. Uh, everything that, that, that consists of the church, of us, comes from Jesus Christ. We're, we're nothing but, Aaron Carpenter, we're nothing but Marianne Barnett, Mike Barnett, Wilson Barnett, Glenn R. Scott. We're nothing but that without Jesus Christ. We're individuals without him. But because we're all partakers of one bread, we now become a unit instead of individuals. Do y'all see where I'm going now? I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to, I, I, I know that I'm not, I, I know I haven't made complete sense yet, but do you see what I'm trying to do? Okay, all right, so I, I'm trying to say that we're no longer in the church as a body. We're no longer individuals, all right? Now, I'm going somewhere with this. Um, uh, so only that which comes out of Christ is the church. That, that's, all right, that only that, the, the rib, only that which comes out of Christ, only that which came out of Adam made Eve. Only that which comes out of Christ is the church. It has nothing to do with uh, with Mike, Josh, Lisa, Marianne, or anybody else making up what is called the church. It's Christ in all of them. That's what makes up the church. Christ is all and in all. It's created he him, and he created, created he them. Okay, I'm, I'm getting somewhere. Okay, it's all one. All right, the, the bone, the rib, all right, and, and it, it's a bone. It's symbolic of the resurrection life. 
And uh, there, you know, Second Corinthians five seventeen says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And this is why John nineteen thirty six and Psalm thirty four twenty make it clear that a bone shall not be broken, because that right there goes to show us that we can't lose our salvation. We were the rib that was taken out of Adam, and we are not to be broken. We're not to be severed. It's resurrection life. It's eternal life. And the Bible says that we shall have eternal life. Um, uh, you're a new creature, and you're no longer an individual. You're no longer Mike. You're no longer Mr. Jones or Mrs. Smith. You're no longer any of these things. You are one together in Christ. You are the church. Okay, now, I want to, uh, Acts 2.44, if I could have some, whoever I gave that to you. Thanks, Harris. For, for David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand. That, uh, that's Acts 2.44? Yeah. Acts 2.34. Okay. That's not what I was... I know, that's not, it's 34. 44. Oh, 44. Um, yeah. Okay. Sorry. It's okay. And all that believed were together and had all things common. Okay, well, did you hear that word common? Okay, now, who has Acts 4.32? And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. There it is again. They had all things in common. All things were common. All right, so what, what, what does that word mean? It's a word meaning that it belongs to several. So they had all things common. That means that you belong to several other people. You're no longer an individual. You are a part of a collective body in Jesus Christ. All right, this hand belongs to my body. This hand belongs to this hand. This hand belongs to this head. This hand belongs to this stomach here. This hand belongs to me as a body, all right? And as a body, I, Mike Barnett, represent Jesus Christ, and these are my body parts, and these parts belong to one another. All right, does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. Okay, good. All right, so... Um, now, I, I want to help you understand something. The things that I'm about to tell you, only the Holy Spirit is going to be able to actually make what I'm telling you happen. It's all, it, it's all academic if the Holy Spirit isn't involved. The Holy Spirit has to be involved in what I'm saying because we can't try to work this thing out. We can't try to say, okay, we got we to gotta make sure we work together. We got to make sure that we're all unified here. We got to all pretend here. That, you know. No, it's not about pretend. It's about actually being unified because we're all under the subjection of the Holy Spirit. All right, so now, um, Acts 17, 28. This, is, this, is, this, this verse right here is, uh, is, another, is another reference to how that we need Jesus Christ to make us of any value as a church, okay? So, Acts 17, 28. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. So, in him we live and breathe and have our being. In him we are who we are, okay? In him we are Eve, all right? We came out of Adam. All right, we were in Adam. We were taken out of the man, all right, Jesus Christ. All right, so we are Eve. I told you, this is, this is for my prayer group because I know that you're a little bit more in depth, and so I want to make sure that I'm preaching a little bit more meat to you, okay? So, so, so we're taken out of, out of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's, that makes us the church, all right? Apart from Christ, we're nothing. Um, the, the fact is, without the branches... Christ can't do anything either. Now, I know that he said, you know, he says, without me, he can do nothing. But here's the thing. God made it to where Adam and Eve both were together. He said, God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. There's a duality there. There's a partnership there. And I'm not saying that Christ can't do anything. I, I, I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is, is God designed it to where if Christ doesn't have the church, he can do nothing. And if the church doesn't have Christ, they can do nothing. 
It has to be a partnership. It has to be an agreement with one another, doing things together as a unit. All right, now, um, um, until we start living like we're a, a, a part of a church instead of thinking we can do this thing without it. See, that's the problem that we're facing today. We don't realize the importance of a bodily unit. We still think it's Mr. and Mrs. Jones and Mr. Smith and, and, and Sister Nancy and all these other, uh, you know, these other individual people. Uh, you know, we, we, have to, we have to start realizing that we, we're a unit. We're created that way. We belong to a body of believers, the church. Um, Christ can do nothing just as we can do nothing without him, all right? Uh, uh, 1 John 4, 19, uh, if you turn there, okay? Look what it says in 1 John 4, 19. We love him because he first loved us, all right? Now, when you look at the way that that's worded, it's we are loving him because he first loved us. How do we love him? Okay, we love him by keeping his commandments, by doing the thing, you know, you, you, you say, you know, you know, a, a woman who, who decides that she's gonna uh, sleep with a man to prove that she loves him before they're married, love is not, uh, love, uh, love is nothing without the law. The law, love fulfills the law, and the law says don't commit adultery, don't commit fornication. The law, love is the fulfilling of the law, all right? So we're loving him because he first loved us, which means we're doing what God designed us to do because we love him. This is our motivation, all right? Now, 1 Corinthians 13, 1 to 3, Brother Glenn. So I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity. I have become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I have nothing. I, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Okay, so without love... All right, which we've decided is God. All right, God is love. Without, the, without, without our love, because he first loved us. And we love him. We, plural, we love him because he first loved us. Uh, without that love to motivate us to do the things that God would have for us to do, we're, we, we, can't, we can't do this. Um, individualism, is, individualism is what's killing the church. Live streaming has really helped out with that. Um, you know, it's, it's not about, it's, it's not about can we do without the church? You know, any fool who says that I don't need the church has no idea the creature that he was designed to be. I'm talking about a person who, who is a Christian. If somebody is truly a born again Christian and he says, I really don't need the church very much, I can do without the church, all right? And I, I'm, you know, I realize that, you know, I realize that, you know, that we're all in church right now. I understand that. But we can still have the mindset that I really don't need the church to help me out. I can do this individually. If you are an, if you are a, if, if you are an individual who says, I can do this without the church, the, the Bible says you are created for that. You were created to be a unit, to be a body. That's why the Bible says that they had all things in common. The Holy Spirit was working in the first century church in such a tremendous way that it, it wasn't, you know, it, you know, I, it, it wasn't so much that I, I, I had to say, everything that I have is yours, all right? It, it's not so much that I had to say, uh, my time is yours, my life is yours, my life belongs to New Grace Baptist Church, and I'm not talking about the building, I'm talking about the people of this church. All right? It's not so much that I had to say it. I got to say it. It means that you belong to me and I belong to you and we belong to Jesus Christ. We're one. That's, the, that's what the church is all about. That's what the church is meant to be. Um, so uh, tonight, what, what makes a great church? All right, Two things are necessary. Two things are necessary to make a great church. And it's very simple. 
Uh, and I want you to write these things down, okay? The spreading or increase of Christ. That's the first thing. I think we can all agree with that, okay? The spreading or the increase of Christ. But then there's another one that's necessary, and you have to have both. The consuming of ourself. All right? Mortify your flesh. Mortify the members that, are, that mortify your members, your flesh, your body, the things that, the, your, your individualism, the things you want to do apart from everybody else. This is why we don't see the unity that we saw in the first century. Um, some churches spread Christ, but they spread just as much of themselves. New ideas, new outreach, you know, uh, more giving, other ideas like that, etc. That doesn't work. Some churches don't spread Christ at all and are individually dependent, uh, you know, coming to church to do what, some, you know, to do God some sort of a favor. You know, I, I'm going to church to make God happy. It's not going to work either. It's wrong. Only the church that spreads Christ will see the increase of Christ if self is consumed. That's why we have that song, Pentecostal Power. Uh, all self-consume, all sin destroy with earnest zeal and due. Each waiting heart to work for the, O oh Lord, our strength as a whole, as a body, renew. That's the old time power, the Pentecostal power, see. Um, th this is why John the Baptist said, he must increase, but I must decrease. There has to be a spreading of Jesus Christ, but there also has to be a consummation of self. And I'm going to tell you something. When you decide, Lord, I want that, God will be out of you, the individualism in your life. God will, God will work it out of you. You might be one of the most stubborn Christians there are, kind of like me, all right? But God is going to beat the living tar out of you until you finally yield to the creature God has called for you to be. And you can think you know all the answers as much as you want to, but until you realize that God created a unit with the church and with him and with one another, you're never going to understand the full purpose of why God allowed the church to be made. So, you know, the, uh, you know, he, you know, he said he must increase. He, the Jesus and the church, his body must increase. All right. He must increase. The church must increase. But I, as an individual, my own opinions, my own wants, my own selfishness, my own, my own desires for the church on my own, even though nobody else agrees with me, all right, that kind of a thing. All that is consumed. And we say, I want the church to increase. That's why it says, let each esteem others better than themselves. I love the singularity of other. Let each esteem other better than themselves. I, I've never, you know, I've always thought that was a funny way of wording that in Philippians, but I look at that as a unit, the church. Let each esteem other better than themselves. That means that we need to make sure that we are seeking to better everyone else. That's what discipleship's all about. You know, if, if, if I, you know, I, I said this last Sunday, if God were to take me away from this church, there's not really a whole lot that's happened here within 15 years. But if God were to take me away from this church and somebody came and took this pulpit and this church exploded and God began to do great things and revival broke out and the town was reached, I will be satisfied because I know that God kept me here to hold the rope until that next person came to do something. You see what I'm, you see what I'm trying to get at? Okay. So it's, it's not about individual wants. Yes, individually, Mike Barnett wants to be the one in the limelight who says, yes, Mike Barnett's leading the way to New, uh, New Grace Baptist Church reaching Tarboro. But that's the individual that needs to be consumed. He must increase, but I must decrease, or it's going to kill the church. It's going to kill the church. The church must increase. I must decrease. Why must the church increase? Because it's his body. The church must increase. It's not about what I want. It's not about my individual opinion. It's not about that's how I feel. No, it's all about this is what I'm called to be, a part of a body of believers in Christ Jesus. So, you know, I, would, you know, I always, the R. Scots will tell you, I always ask them, you know, I always ask people when they're moving, did you find a good church? 
You know, did you, have you have you found a church? You know, it, I, I, I've, I've heard people say this, you know, well, I, no, actually, I didn't. Basically, they didn't see it very necessary. And the fact is, is it's still an individual mentality. It needs to be that I need to find a place where I can fit in with the rest and serve Jesus with them together in love in Christ Jesus as a unit, as a body. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. He must increase. The church must increase, but I must decrease. I hope you're following me here. All right, but um, once again, the Holy Ghost will, will, will be able to help us with this. It's, it's not something that we can do on our own. We need the Holy Spirit's help. This is another reason why we need revival. It's a union. Just like we heard read, you're all one in America. No. New Grace Baptist Church? No. You're all one in Christ. Christ. All right? So I want us to look at Genesis 2.18, all right? After all that I've tried to explain to you tonight, I said at the beginning of this message that God's design for the creation, uh, from the creation has made us as his church necessary. We're necessary to him. And I compared the church to the woman taken from Adam. And so in Genesis chapter 1, I want you to look at what it says in verse 18. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's see, 2.18. I'm sorry. Look at, look at Genesis 2.18. And the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. See, Jesus needs us as much as we need him. It's a, it's, a, it's a, a duality. It's a partnership. Is Jesus God? Yes, he is. And I'm not downgrading or cutting him down in any way. And I'm not trying to say that, 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 that we're equal. You know, I'm, not, I'm not trying to say anything like that. But in a sense, I am saying that God the Father has made us with Jesus Christ equals to work together as, as partners, as one. In, in, as one in Jesus Christ, right? That's, that's, that, that's the continuation of my message on the church. I hope that I'm, try, I'm trying to breathe life into the church. So let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this time that we can uh, uh, just be together. And Lord, I pray that you just help us, Lord, to just consider what we've heard. And Lord, just to, uh, just to meditate on it and to consider it. And Lord, I pray that uh, we would realize, Lord, uh, that that we that we belong to one another, Lord. That we that we ought to have all things in common. That we belong to several, and that we're one in Jesus Christ, Lord. I pray that you'd help us to see that oneness, Lord. It's just a beautiful picture. It's not something that I have. I, I don't think I've communicated it well, Lord. But I, I I do see what the Word of God is saying, and I want to. Say it more clearly. So, Lord, I, I'm trusting that you're going to just help us, Lord, in the upcoming days and months, Lord, as we look at these things, as we consider these things, as we consider how we think in, uh, on Sunday nights, as we consider uh, other matters in Sunday morning, and as we, as we look at what the church is all about on Wednesday night. Lord, I pray that you would just help us, Lord. May it, may it be that we are drawn closer to you through each step, Lord, that we go through down this dark path that we're in, Lord. The, the world is in chaos right now, but, Lord, we... We know, Father, that a church, a great church, a great church can shine the light in this dark world in ways that this world could never have possibly imagined. And Lord, I just ask that you just help us to grasp a hold of these things, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we ask all these things. Amen. All right, well, we'll see you.